Well, uh, now that we've gotten a few of our, our technical issues uh, squared away, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is uh, Christine Skelly. I'm the equine extension specialist here at Michigan State University. And I'm also the uh, director of our online horse management program, My Horse University. So um, it's nice actually to be a speaker on one of our webinars again. Uh, we have a lot of uh, great partners that we invite to uh, give webinars so we can uh, bring you speakers uh, and expertise from all across the United States. Um, uh, but today we're bringing it back home, literally, as I sit in my office at the house. So um, I think we will just go ahead and get right into it. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, what we're going to cover tonight. Um, first, we're going to spend a little bit of time identifying your equestrian goals. Um, I think that's really important before you try to decide uh, what professionals uh, you want to uh, have involved uh, with you and your horse. And then we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about some of the professionals out there that you may have either daily or weekly interaction with, um, like a barn manager, instructor, or trainer, um, professionals that are more uh, focused on your horse's health, like your veterinarian and farrier, um, where you would go for nutritional support. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, cooperative extension and um, some of the expertise that may be provided to you uh, either in your county or at the uh, land grant university in your state. We'll talk about some different organizations uh, that are available at the national, state, and local level uh, that may be a good fit for you. Um, as well as uh, events, networking at events, and a little bit about, we'll just touch on social media uh, before we call it a night. So uh, one of the reasons where um, we, I chose this topic is because I've been working with a few people that are really just getting into the horse industry. And I, I spend uh, quite a bit of my time just uh, uh, connecting them uh, to professionals uh, that have the expertise to help them out. Um, so uh, with that being said, there's about uh, 7.2 million horses um, in the United States. And uh, the horse activities uh, that take place, um, uh, about 537,000 of these horses are uh, used for work. Uh, so that might be carriage driving, um, it could be uh, working on a ranch, uh, police horses, um, any horse that's used uh, as part of somebody's occupation um, would be considered uh, work or transportation. We have another segment, about 1.2 million horses that are actually being raced on the track. Um, another 1.2 million uh, horses that are being shown um, competitively. And then the rest of the horses or the majority of the horses are actually being used uh, for recreation. So they're not being shown, but maybe they're uh, taken out on the trail. Uh, this would include those pasture ornaments that uh, maybe are retired out in the field. Um, just your uh, backyard horse that you go out and you ride uh, three to five times a week. Um, so that makes up the biggest portion actually of our horse industry. And this, these are all uh, newer numbers uh, taken from the American Horse Council survey that uh, they did in 2017 and uh, released this data um, to us in 2018. So if you wanna learn more about the uh, horse industry on a national basis. Uh, the American Horse Council uh, website uh, has uh, some of the survey results up there and then you can also buy uh, the bigger survey results. So we'll start out talking about what are your equestrian goals um, and this will help you target 
the people that you want in your horse network. So uh, Gwen, would you mind pulling up that poll? Okay, so I'm gonna let you guys fill out this poll. Um, I'm asking you to select your top three equestrian goals. So you can choose um, out of uh, companionship uh, with your horse, competition or sport, exercise, uh, enjoying nature, uh, having a happy, healthy horse, lifelong learning, uh, teaching life skills to your child, uh, relaxation, social outlet, and then on my screen anyway, the last option is uh, kind of covered up, but that is successful uh, business. So maybe you are a professional in our industry and uh, your, your horse, uh, horses are actually part of your income or your horse interests are part of your income. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, select three and then press submit. And uh, Gwen will let us know uh, what our top three are. And it takes a second for the polls to, um, results to come in. So let's okay. let it run for Great. just a minute here. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and fill out mine too. <laughs> Looks like it, we're at about 75% of the participants. We're almost at 100% actually now it's bumping up. Okay. So we're almost there. Great. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and I'll share the results in just a second. Excellent, thank you, Gwen. All right, let's see what our top, top three are. Oh, we do have some professionals in the audience, so welcome. Um, we have a uh, lifelong learning that, that would be my, one of my picks, happy, healthy horse, another, another pick companionship. Okay. And then after that, we've got some, it looks like some parents teaching life skills to their kids, relaxation, uh, competition, exercise, nature, social outlet, are the very last three. Um, and I think sometimes we do underestimate uh, the exercise benefits of um, working with our horses. So if you have a Fitbit, keep that Fitbit on and uh, see how many calories you burn while you're cleaning stalls or riding your horse. <laughs> and it's, it's actually quite impressive. All right, well, thanks for participating in that poll kind of helps us focus for the rest of our, our talk here. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, boarding facilities. And a lot of times this is a great entry level. Um, if, you, if you have a horse um, and you're new, but you're new to horses, uh, at least horse ownership, is actually boarding it at a uh, facility. Um, even if you have, uh, a place uh, at your own uh, house, a uh, barn at your own house, if you've never uh, uh, managed a horse before, um, there's a lot of in and outs you can learn from a really good uh, boarding facility about the correct way to manage horses. Um, when you're looking at it for a boarding facility, um, actually let's put up the next poll, Gwen. Getting a little ahead of myself here. And I believe this next poll is, uh, what's the most important factor uh, for you when you're choosing a boarding facility? So I'll let you guys take a second to uh, make one choice on this one. And we'll see what our, what our top choices are. And this will be good for the professionals in our audience uh, as well to see see what the rest of us are looking for in our boarding facilities. I haven't uh, boarded my horse in forever and then we sold our small farm about uh, three years ago. So I've been at uh, three different barns since. So uh, I'm getting reacquainted with being a boarder. <laughs> Uh, 
But just starting, uh, starting to think about uh, what you're looking for at a boarding facility. Um, obviously, you want your facility to be clean and safe. Um, oh, here we go. So location is a big factor. We want to be as close as we can be to our horses. That makes total sense. Uh, pasture and turnout, I'm actually really glad to see that that's uh, number two uh, because uh, turning your horse out is really important for their health and well-being. Um, having access to good pasture can actually um, save a lot of money from a nutritional standpoint as well. Um, facility appearance and riding area um, are next. And then the cost, oh, we've got a lot of big spenders here. The cost and the people are uh, low priorities. So that's interesting, interesting results. Um, so we, we're looking for a clean and safe facility um, where we want a facility that uh, prioritizes the uh, well-being of the horse and considers horse behavior in every step of their management practices. Um, you're going to want services that fit your needs. So uh, some people are on full board, some people are on partial board where they're still cleaning out their own stalls, but maybe the uh, stable management is doing the feeding. Um, there's a lot of different types of packages uh, that boarding facilities can offer. Um, Usually you wanna be in a barn where you don't feel like you're alone in a crowd. So being in a barn where other people, maybe if you like trail riding uh, and you can find a barn where other people like trail riding too, um, that is a big, big plus. And just the general attitude of a barn. Um, is it open? Um, is it um, free of gossip? Um, is it a real positive attitude? A lot of times uh, that is a reflection on the owner and manager of the, of the barn. And also are barn rules enforced? And, and maybe you're not necessarily a rules person, uh, but when you get, you know, 10 to 20 horse people in uh, one location, uh, rules can uh, really help uh, keep things running well and uh, keep the uh, attitude positive in the barn. So uh, one of the professionals then that becomes really important is the barn manager. And having a knowledgeable uh, barn manage manager that's comfortable sharing that knowledge uh, with the boarders, uh, the clientele, is really important. So what is that uh, manager's background? Uh, where did they get their experience uh, would be a question um, that you potentially could ask. Is the uh, barn gossip free? So when you first talk to a manager, if they're already talking about other boarders or other barns, uh, uh, other boarding establishments in a negative way, um, to me that raises a red flag that that's probably not the right space for me to be. Does the barn have a good reputation? And uh, how can you find out if a barn has a good reputation? A lot of times uh, talking to veterinarians, farriers, some other professionals we're gonna be uh, 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 covering here a little later on, uh, they may have some uh, good ideas of uh, what boarding facilities are uh, pretty positive and what boarding facilities may have some um, issues here and there is the uh, manager observant. So as she's, she or he is walking down the barn aisle, are they looking at the horses? Are they looking at the horses as they, as they go through the pasture? Um, are they uh, you know, looking for water buckets that need to be filled um, or a, a fence rail that's down? Um, it's really important that the uh, barn manager is observant and that the um, people that are assisting the manager are observing your horses as well. And that brings us to, can they hold on to a consistent staff? Um, if you're at a barn where the turnaround for the people that are feeding or cleaning stalls or leading horses to turn out is constantly in an uproar, um, then I believe it 
probably will affect uh, the general care of your horse. So if uh, there's a staff that are being introduced and they've been there for several years, for me, that's a big plus as far as how the facility is being uh, managed. Okay, next slide. Or that's me. <laughs> Um, some things that you want to discuss, and, and these are things that uh, you may feel a little um, hesitant to discuss, but to me, they're, they're really important um, in how a facility is managed. First of all, and one thing that's pretty common to discuss is what is the feeding program, but not just the feeding, but the feeding and watering program. Um, you want to make sure that your horse always has uh, uh, access to water 24-7. Um, and then also, what is the turnout schedule? Um, I have a, a, a horse uh, that basically can't be stalled, so he has to be out on pasture all the time. Um, but most horses need about four to six hours of uh, turnout uh, daily um, to... Uh, to really have a, a good sense of well-being. And here's one question that most people don't think about asking, what's the manure management plan for that barn? And that sounds funny, but I can't tell you how many nice, nice uh, farms I've been to where if you turn the corner and you get in the back, you will find a mountain of manure someplace, or if you keep going into the back 40, you'll find uh, some wetland uh, where the manure has just been shoved. So you, you should know what, the, uh, manure, uh, what their manure management plan is. What is the cleaning schedule for the stalls? Um, how is that, how and where is that manure stored? Uh, you wanna make sure that your horse doesn't have access to uh, fresh manure from other horses. Um, especially if a horse is sick, if that manure is uh, taken and spread out in the pasture, uh, that could actually uh, be a biosecurity issue. Uh, let's say with strangles uh, can be spread uh, through, uh, through fresh manure in the, in the pasture. So a uh, manure management plan would be something I'd wanna cover uh, with the farm manager. Um, as well as their bio, biosecurity policy. So that includes, um, do they enforce a Coggins test uh, for all horses coming onto the barn? Uh, what is the vaccination plan? Um, when, you're, when you're in a boarding facility, your horse is basically part of a large herd. Uh, so having everybody on a, um, uh, at least a core vaccination program is uh, critical for the health of the horses. Also, uh, what's the parasite control uh, plan? Uh, and that may need to include both flying insects as well as internal parasites. And what is the uh, quarantine policy? So if a horse does get sick, is there a place that that horse can be quarantined? And then uh, as we've all seen with um, the California fires and some of the flooding uh, through the hurricanes, it's really important that these large farms have an emergency plan. Um, but that starts with just the, um, you know, the more common accidents that will happen on a horse farm for both horse and humans. What's the emergency plan there? Does anybody on farm staff have uh, first aid training? Um, what happens during extreme weather? Uh, if your horse is out on the pasture or even inside and there's a tornado warning? Um, is there anything that's implemented from a emergency um, management plan? Uh, what happens if electricity is lost for long periods of time? Does the farm have a generator uh, to at least make sure that all horses have access to water uh, if the electricity is lost? Um, and then what's the evacuation plan if necessary? So these would all be some uh, points to uh, talk about before you uh, 
uh, become involved uh, at a boarding establishment. As far as uh, housing, um, if you're planning on housing your horse indoors, uh, you want to walk through the barn aisle. Hopefully the barn aisle is clean um, and, and safe. It's not full of uh, obstacles to try to lead your horse past. Um, from a ventilation standpoint, uh, the barn aisle should smell nice and fresh. And it's actually, um, if you can visit barns uh, during the winter time when they're kept uh, relatively closed, that's gonna give you the best uh, indication of the actual ventilation of the barn. You should feel some airflow during the summer months as well. Um, stall size uh, is important. A lot of our older barns are usually 10 by 10s, um, but I, I would prefer a 12 by 12 for most, uh, 12 by 12 foot. Uh, stall size for uh, most of our, our light horses. Uh, some of our big warm bloods and stuff would probably be more comfortable in a, at least a 12 by 14 stall. Uh, so consider stall size as you look through and make sure as you're walking around that uh, the surfaces are smooth, there's no um, nails uh, sticking out uh, where horses can get hurt. Uh, make it's always nice if there's visibility for the horse. So the more a horse can see out, see other horses, hear other horses, um, probably the happier they're gonna be because that'll be more like an established herd for them. And then again, uh, is turnout provided for the horses that are um, housed inside? And as far as outdoor housing, uh, you wanna have a, a really nice fence line. Make sure that the perimeter fence is very solid, especially if it's on a road with traffic. Um, and actually, uh, when I go to a horse facility, the first thing I notice about it is the fencing. I am a fencing fanatic. So you can really sway me with a uh, very nice fence. <laughs> um, but there also should be some shelter for the horse. And um, horses need shelter uh, both during sunny weather as well as, uh, as cold, wet weather. Um, so when it's sunny and the bugs are out, uh, the horses will go into the shelter, seek, seek shade uh, to get away from the um, uh, biting uh, flies. Um, and then during the uh, winter, during the rain, they'll also seek shelter. Are those shelters clean and dry? Um, I kept my horse at a, um, when we first sold our farm, I moved our horse uh, to a, a boarding facility and he was out on pasture with a, a nice lean-to out for about four horses. And uh, I happened to move him during the midst of winter when we had about know a foot of snow on the ground um, and everything was just hunky-dory and then spring came and uh, the snow started melting and lo and behold uh, the shelter that was provided uh, had about six inches of water standing in it uh, just because of the lay of the land um, and it wasn't built up enough uh, to keep it out of the muck and mud. Um, so it really uh, didn't turn out to be a very good facility. It kind of changed uh, totally uh, going from uh, winter to spring. So you, it's nice when you can see a facility through all the seasons and don't be surprised if something changes. Um, and then also, what is the feeding and water management? Um, if a horse is out uh, in a pasture in a group, how do they manage those groups? And then, uh, as some of you noted, uh, the riding facility is gonna be important. And so how that uh, farm manages the surface, um, you want a nice, safe, even surface for both you and your horse. Um, the railing should be safe. Uh, the lighting should be adequate, especially if you need to ride uh, during the uh, evening. Does the establishment have the type of equipment you need for whatever discipline uh, you work in? And what is the uh, riding eti etiquette uh, like at that arena? Um, what are the rules? What's the schedule? Uh, are there dogs running loose that can cause a hazard? Um, 
And then is there trail access? So the uh, other uh, professional we're gonna talk about is the uh, riding instructor. Um, and a lot of boarding facilities will have uh, riding instructors that work out of their barn, and that may also be a reason you choose one uh, boarding facility over another. Um, but real quick, uh, Gwen, could you uh, show up, show the poll for uh, riding instructors? And so real quick, uh, choose the most important trait in a riding instructor. And I'm gonna do the same here. And I know it's hard out of all of those traits because they're all really important traits. Uh, but just to get an idea um, what you think would, might be the most important uh, aspect of uh, a riding instructor, at least, at least for you. So when Gwen gets that up, um, we still have quite a few coming in, so I'll leave it open. Okay, just a well, I'm going to just start on the slide then. Um, uh, writing instructors need to align with your uh, discipline and experience level. Uh, so you may not need the Grand Prix. Uh, dressage instructor if you're still at training or first level uh, with your horse. Um, so picking, and, and that Grand Prix uh, instructor may not, not actually be a very good fit for you either just from a instruction style. So um, aligning your discipline and your experience level with your riding instructor um, is really important. So let's see, uh, teaching style, that was my top pick too. Um, and then after that, we have reputation and skill level, um, certification, I'm glad to see that was um, some choices, and personality are all important. Okay, great, thank you for doing that. Um, learning style, uh, is uh is important however you however you're learning at that period of time in your life may dictate um what type of uh instructor you're going to gravitate towards um the older i get the more i really enjoy a really relaxing uh writing session um it's just very uh therapeutic for me um, and I also like to know the theory behind everything I'm being taught. So the P's and Q's as to why, why uh, this works, this doesn't. Um, a personality can also be important. Um, not everybody is gonna click uh, with George Morris. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, I remember when I was younger, I had a, um, a hunter jumper instructor that uh, I think my last lesson was when I broke down in tears with him. So it just wasn't a great personality fit, but he was an excellent instructor. Um, it just wasn't the right time in my life for uh, that type of personality. Um, also some uh, other traits, you want an instructor that really promotes safety. Uh, in the riding lesson. And, you know, our sport is a very dangerous sport. Um, so when you're entrusting your, uh, yourself and your horse with an instructor, uh, they really need to have your safety as a um, first and foremost, not get you into a situation where you or your horse is gonna get hurt. Um, they should uh, maintain a professional uh, appearance and attitude. Um, they should stay very attentive and engaged um, in a lesson. Um, I've, I've heard complaints over uh, from parents uh, from, uh, with their kids in lessons um, where the instructors were more interested in what was going on on the phone than uh, working with their, their kids. So uh, instructors need to maintain their attentiveness and engagement. Uh, instructor needs to be progressive. So if, you're, if you've been uh, working with a writing instructor for six months, um, but you really haven't uh, uh, progressed uh, from a maneuver 
standpoint, uh, from a skills level, um, maybe your horse isn't progressing, uh, then it may be that you need to look uh, for a different instructor. The instructor should also practice good sportsmanship. If you're going to the horse shows with the instructor and uh, uh, they're, um, uh, you know, voicing some real negative uh, opinions about the judging or about other competitors, um, then that really isn't good sportsmanship. Um, facilities is important, I think. Um, I want to ride at a really nice, relaxing place uh, that stays dry when it's raining. <laughs> um, the instructor should be insured and should be able to show you proof of insurance. And if you're uh, not on your own horse, if you're using lesson horses from time to time, uh, those lesson horses should be uh, well-maintained, uh, in healthy condition, and they should fit uh, your uh, experience level and your discipline. So how do you find, how do you hook up with uh, qualified uh, uh, riding instructors? Um, and one way to do it is through uh, certification programs. Now, if you travel to the United Kingdom, everybody that works within the horse industry has to be accredited. Um, and most people would be accredited through the British Horse Society. Um, and they have to go through uh, uh, classroom and hands-on training to uh, receive that uh, accreditation. And that gives you a comfort level when uh, somebody hangs out their shingle uh, that they know what they're uh, doing. They've uh, gone to school and uh, have been certified that they are ready to teach at a certain level. In the States, we don't have mandatory certification, uh, but we do have some organizations that will uh, certify. And actually, the British Horse uh, Society has a USA uh, division. Um, but probably the more popular certification in the States is the uh, Certified Horsemanship Association. And uh, they have a list of riding instructors, and you can uh, find uh, the closest certified instructor in your area and you will know what level they teach to and what discipline they teach in. As well as the American Riding Instructors Association um, also has a similar type of program um, and all of these programs really promote uh, safety and the well-being of the horse. Um, and good foundation type of horsemanship skills and building on those foundations and uh, uh, working up through levels. So the last uh, professional that I'm gonna um, uh, ask you to fill out a little uh, a poll on is the uh, horse trainer. So Gwen, would you bring up that poll? Um, so when you're selecting a, a horse trainer, what is the number one uh, most important uh, uh, trait in that horse trainer? And I'm going to fill it out myself here. This is harder. <laughs> They're all really important. Yeah, start there. Okay. So um, trainers differ in some respects from instructors and in that they're really focused on your horse. So they're gonna be riding your horse. But that being said, um, a good trainer is gonna know what your, uh, what your goals are and they will train your horse to fit those goals. Uh, trustworthiness is the uh, top quality uh, with, uh, trainers, uh, followed by qualifications and reputation. Um, okay, very good. Thank you. Oops. So when we're talking about qualifications, uh, there may be some professional organizations uh, that this uh, trainer is associated with. Um, uh, USD uh, United uh, States Dressage Federation, 
equestrian version. Um, American Quarter Horse Association, some of your uh, breed and discipline associations. Uh, many of them have professional organizations with, uh, uh, where uh, they can also receive uh, uh, extra education. Um, so that's one, one way you can uh, look at a trainer's qualifications as well as their performance record in the uh, show arena and uh, their reputation. And reputation becomes really important. Uh, you have to be careful about, uh, you know, gossip uh, versus uh, what's the truth. Um, but uh, it's always good to ask around and uh, see what the general consensus is as to uh, a trainer's qualifications. You wanna make sure that that trainer matches your goals um, and also matches your horse's breed. So, you know, obviously you're not gonna take a, um, a uh, Tennessee walker to be trained by most uh, uh, quarter horse trainers um, and vice versa. Uh, you want that trainer to match your uh, breed and discipline. Um, especially if you've really progressed uh, in the levels and you have some very specific goals uh, that you wanna work with your horse on. Uh, the trainer needs to promote good horse welfare. Is there turnout at the barn? Um, are they feeding a forage-based diet? Um, are they practicing uh, humane training practices? And this, is, this can be kind of hard because if you don't know, if you haven't been in the horse industry for a, a long time, um, you may not have a good understanding of uh, what constitutes inhumane uh, training practices. Um, so one thing I always tell people is if, uh, if you watch something and your stomach is kind of hurting and you're embarrassed to talk about it with other people, uh, potentially um, that could be a uh, inhumane uh, training practice. If, uh, if uh, somebody is using equipment that is illegal in competition, uh, potentially that could be a humane, uh, inhumane training practice. Um, so uh, you, you want to uh, be able to uh, trust, and I, I know trustworthy was an important uh, aspect of the trainer. You want to be able to trust that they have uh, the welfare of your horse in mind um, and that they're going to use uh, humane training practices and not try to take shortcuts. And sometimes that means you have to, um, you have to make your goals realistic so that you're not rushing the, uh, the training process. Is your trainer ethical? Um, so that means are they being honest with you? Are they being honest at competition? Are they abiding by all the rules? No drugs, uh, no uh, illegal alterations of the horse's tail, uh, all of that. Um, are they following all of the rules and regulations set out to them by the uh, associations? Do they practice good sportsmanship? Um, are they congratulatory uh, to others, um, even if they don't get a ribbon? Um, are, they, are they known to be a, a positive influence on the showground, or are they a negative influence on the showground? And then are they transparent? Um, are they willing to discuss their training methods with you if you have questions? Uh, are they transparent, transparent about when they're riding your horse, how often they're riding their horse, and even who's riding their horse? Maybe they have assistants uh, who are helping as well. And then um, if you, they are involved in a sales transaction, are they upfront with you about the commissions associated with those sales? And do they have an open door policy so that you can come and uh, check on your horse at any time? Uh, these would all be questions uh, I think that um, a horse owner would wanna know from their trainer. And uh, getting into the healthcare uh, standpoint, we have uh, veterinarians. And uh, it is always great when you uh, have access to a good equine uh, practitioner. Uh, sometimes we're in remote locations uh, to where uh, 
we may just have a large animal veterinarian who doesn't necessarily specialize in horses. And, and that's, that's usually great for most of what we're asking the veterinarian to do. Uh, where that may become a problem is uh, during some emergencies or uh, lameness issues, uh, stuff where having uh, more of a horse uh, or equine uh, uh, oriented practice would really help out. Uh, but in general, uh, when a veterinarian comes out for uh, annual checkup of your horse, um, they should be checking the vitals of the horse, uh, talk to you about your horse's body condition score or how much fat covering your horse has. Um, they should uh, look at your horse's uh, teeth, make sure, uh, do a, a full dental exam. Um, they should be checking your horse's eyes and eyesight. Uh, they should watch your horse move, at, uh, ideally at both a walk and a trot. Uh, looking for any uneven evenness or uh, muscle discomfort. Um, they should also discuss uh, your vaccination program with you. Um, if you're showing your horse or traveling to workshops or even traveling off-site to trail rides, um, there may be some other vaccinations beyond the core five uh, vaccines that uh, you want to discuss with your veterinarian. And they should also uh, discuss your horse's parasite program with you. So these are all things that should go on during an annual checkup. If they just jump out of the truck, uh, give your horse their, the core uh, vaccines and jump back in, um, then you may need, you may want to uh, find somebody that's uh, going to take a little bit more time at your farm. Um, ideally, it's always great uh, if the veterinarian specializes in either your riding discipline or your breed, because there are some uh, discipline or breed related uh, issues that come into play for high performance horses or um, uh, a certain breeds uh, with genetic predispositions uh, for cer certain conditions. Uh, so if that uh, vet is tuned in into those um, health concerns, um, they can help, uh, help you catch that uh, sooner. Um, is your vet, uh, does your vet have a, a good staff to where they can do some follow-up? Uh, and send out reminders uh, in their practice? And then what's the emergency policy? So are they gonna be available uh, for that two in the morning call? Um, do they have the facilities to take on a, a colic surgery at their place? Um, a lot of veterinarians will be, have a mobile clinic um, and if that's the case, uh, what's the closest emergency clinic if your horse needs surgery or uh, further investigation um, that you can get to? Do they have a good uh, referral policy with a, cl a clinic uh, that's not too far of a drive? And, uh, and what are they doing in continued education? Uh, veterinarians are uh, required to uh, pursue continued education, and you may want to just talk to them and see what their specialty is. Potentially it's nutrition or uh, lameness or reproduction. Uh, it's, it's always good to know what their specialties are. And then uh, you can also use your veterinarian as a good resource uh, for identifying other professionals, even farm sitters. Um, uh, veterinarians usually have a staff of uh, technicians. Uh, a lot of times the technicians uh, uh, will sit on farms uh, as well. Um, all of your uh, veterinarians should be members of the American Association of Equine Practitioners, and uh, that will uh, provide them some of their uh, continued education resources through conferences and whatnot. And uh, your farrier uh, is extremely important, especially depending on uh, your horse. So if you have a horse, uh, that needs special shoeing, or maybe you're uh, competing in certain disciplines like reining, where you have to have uh, sliding plates on the back of your horses uh, uh, on your back feet. Um, having a, uh, a uh, 
very fear that's uh, accomplished in, in that discipline area uh, is, can be extremely helpful. Um, so what is their experience? Uh, what does that uh, balance out with your horse's needs? Do they have accred accreditation? Uh, you know, there's a lot of people uh, trimming horses' feet here and there and even um, putting on keg shoes um, that have never been accredited. So again, because we live in the States, there's no required uh, certification or education or schooling or internships for farriers. But those are all things that a good farrier will have in their background. So, so talk to them. Uh, see what their skill level is. Don't just go by uh, how much they're charging. Um, what is their reputation? Um, usually you can get a pretty good feel for um, the skill level of a farrier uh, based on their reputation. Are they available and dependable? Uh, do they show up when called? I always, I always cut my, both my farrier and my uh, veterinarians a little bit of slack as far as punctuality uh, because sometimes they end up with a horse that's just taking way more time um, uh, to work on uh, than they may have anticipated. So I'll give them a little bit of leadway for sure in that respect. But if they're going to be uh, two, three hours late, then there probably should be a follow-up call there uh, to let you know. Um, and when the farrier does come in, does he watch your horse track? Is he patient? And does he clean up after himself? You know, I've been in the situation uh, at least once uh, where my horse was trimmed and uh, ended up uh, lame uh, the next day because they stepped on a nail uh, that wasn't picked up. So you really want to make sure um, that uh, the farrier um, is very. Um, conscientious about their workplace and do they stand by their work you know if your horse is lame uh three days later uh will they come out and help you uh investigate what the problem might be make sure you don't have a hot nail or something um and the last uh few we'll talk about have to do with uh nutrition uh finding a good hay producer um in michigan we've had some uh some issues with our, our hay here for uh, a few years. Hay prices are going up. A lot of our hay is being shipped to Florida um, or other places where they've uh, had flooding or whatnot. Um, so our hay prices are going up. Our, the availability of hay, it's uh, getting harder and harder to find. Uh, so finding that uh, good hay producer that will wor work with you, keep your name and number on their list um, as they're bringing in their, um, their hay. Uh, they produce a good product that works for your horse. Um, and they have a consistent product. Uh, they're aware of any toxic issues that may come into play. If you're in the south and raising alfalfa, um, maybe they're more conscientious about uh, blister beetles. Um, if you're in our neck of the woods, they're more conscientious about horealysium, but they understand uh, what are um, uh, potential toxic issues uh, for horse hay. Um, and uh, they stay consistent with their prices. So if there is a, is a splurge um, in a, or is a hay shortage, they're not going to just uh, get you because they can. <laughs> they want you to come back for, as their customer next year. So um, uh, while it's, it's fair that supply and demand that prices increase, but you shouldn't really, um, it shouldn't become uh, detrimental to feeding your horse. Um, they need to stand by their products. So if you open some bales and those bales are moldy in the middle, uh, they won't have any problem in replacing those with uh, clean bales. Um, and all of this is about establishing a, a relationship. It's about being a good customer, calling early before they put up hay, get, making sure you're on that list, staying in contact uh, with your hay producer, um, just establishing uh, that relationship. 
You can find uh, hay producers in your area. A lot of times states, uh, universities will have hay list on their websites. Um, and then also uh, county extension offices may be able to help you locate a uh, hay resource. Feed sales is important as well. Um, where do you go to uh, get your grain or your supplements if you need to feed, um, feed them? Uh, wherever you're getting your feed uh, and whatever uh, type of feed you're buying, is there a quality assurance that goes along with that feed? Um, so is that feed being produced in an elevator uh, where they can ensure that your horse feed isn't exposed to uh, antibiotics from other livestock? Um, because those uh, antibiotics uh, can be toxic to horses and um, uh, you'll end up with uh, extremely sick or uh, uh, fatality in your barn. Um, are the feed salespeople knowledgeable about their product lines? Um, they don't necessarily have to be equine nutrition, nutritionist, uh, but it's definitely helpful if they can uh, at least help guide you to uh, the product line that fits your needs. Um, is the feed uh, feeding area uh, where they um, store their bags uh, clean? Um, and do they um, market their feed at a, com a competitive price? Cooperative Extension can provide a, a really um, great resource for you. And of course, I'm pretty partial being part of our Michigan State uh, Extension Service. Um, but uh, a lot of uh, land grant universities will have a faculty on board that are uh, equine extension uh, specialists. And uh, they may specialize in different aspects of horse management, but uh, most extension people that I know uh, are pretty much jack of all trades when it comes to horse management topics um, and can usually uh, discuss just about anything with you. Um, your county extension office uh, may hold some uh, expertise uh, that you need as far as uh, pasture management, manure management. Um, they don't necessarily have to be horse specialists to help you in those areas. And uh, uh, we'll also offer a lot of programs, our 4-H programs for your youth. So these are great ways to start out in the horse industry and make those connections with uh, professionals and other people uh, in your area who like horses. Uh, your uh, State office may also um, uh, hold uh, educational workshops and provide online resources. Uh, so I work with a lot of co colleagues throughout the United States and uh, most of them are also doing uh, webinars and have uh, great websites uh, full of great uh, uh, information that's very specific for their state. Um, so that's always a, a great resource to get hold of. Community involvement. You can really uh, stretch your resources. Uh, getting involved with uh, at a local level, uh, all the way up to a, a state level. So at a local level, there may be some trail riding groups, uh, breed and discipline associations, um, volunteering that's something that I want to do more of in the next few years uh, is vol volunteering uh, with a therapeutic riding program uh, but there's also rescues you can volunteer and a lot of great youth programs uh, to volunteer with um, one national association uh, that's good to be aware of is the equestrian land conservation resource um, they uh, they do a lot uh, with ensuring that uh, equestrians will have land uh, to ride on, and uh, they can help a lot with some land use policies, uh, keeping your trails open in your state. Uh, so they're a super resource uh, to be aware of. And then uh, most states will have uh, 
their own state horse council that's a member of the American Horse Council. Um, if you are a business owner, getting involved with your state horse council may make a lot of sense from a networking standpoint and staying up uh, with the uh, legislative issues in your area. And then farm bureaus uh, usually also have an equine advisory board that sits within uh, certain uh, regions of a state. Uh, so getting involved with your farm bureau is another opportunity to uh, network with other equestrians. From a youth standpoint, uh, for, there's 4-H, uh, Pony Club, which is uh, a part of the, uh, the whole uh, a branch off from the um, British uh, group. Um, there's always breed and discipline youth organizations and just about every breed we have. Uh, there's also uh, both middle school and high school uh, equestrian teams and rodeo teams, uh, depending on the area you're in. And there's some volunteer opportunities for youth at, um, at a lot of uh, therapy and rescue type organizations. It's always good to uh, learn more about horses no matter what uh, level you're at and Extension will hold a lot of webinars and uh, uh, online courses, um, workshops. Feed dealers uh, do a good job. I'm going to be going out uh, to uh, up north in Michigan in a couple of weeks to uh, work with a vet veterinarian in that area who's holding a uh, learning lunch uh, for a group of her clients. And uh, also riding clinics offer a great way to, uh, it's kind of like going to a church revival. It really uh, can rejuvenate you to go to a riding uh, clinic and hear a fresh opinion on your horsemanship. It may give you some ideas too of where to, uh, where to go from there with you and your horse. Uh, going to events throughout the state, uh, visiting horse shows. If you wanna try to um, uh, look at other riding programs, going to different horse shows and events um, can help you see what people are doing um, and who's helping them get to where they're going. Um, we talked about writing clinics, clinics and educational workshops. Also, uh, online courses are available so that you can learn at your leisure, um, as well as state expos. Um, we'll be at the uh, March Expo here in Michigan um, in a couple of months, and we always have a great time uh, seeing all the different uh, uh, booths, um, as well as all the uh, exhibits and uh, meeting all the people that uh, come to our booth. And fi finally, there's social media, which I think you have to take with a grain of salt. Um, there's a ton of good educational sites. Uh, most of your big universities with equine programs uh, have a Facebook page now, and that's great to get uh, to find out about what type of education educational events are going on in your area. Um, there's some national websites, uh, extensionhorses.org uh, is one, and they do a great job uh, providing resources. Um, Equine Guelph, our partners, our uh, uh, collaborators in Canada, um, they do an excellent job with some of their uh, learning resource uh, resources online. Uh, they have a uh, a colic calculator where you can calculate your horse's risk of colic. They have a biosecurity calculator you can use to calculate uh, your biosecurity risk on your farm. And all of these resources are made free available on their uh, website. So I would definitely go take a look through uh, what they have to offer. And then of course, My Horse University, um, uh, we have some um, great courses and a whole, whole uh, slew of uh, webinars that you can watch at your le leisure. I would suggest that you avoid the real negative sites. I know that there's uh, some horse sites where um, it can get pretty loud, um, pretty mean-spirited. Um, I think it's best just to stay away from those. Um, 
guard your personal information, whatever site you're on, uh, even if it's a horse site, don't assume that somebody won't be on there that would love to know when you're out of town on vacation. <laughs> and uh, closed groups are usually a little safer to share your inf information on if you really feel the need to share that type of information. So with that, I'm gonna ask if there are any questions. And Gwen, if uh, are you still still with us, Gwen? Yes, I am. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know if there are any questions that came on the queue, or if we're good to nope. go. No questions right now. All right, great. Well, if you do have questions, uh, just uh, give us an email, and we'll be glad to answer those for you. And um, we really appreciate your feedback. We'll be uh, sending out a, a survey on this webinar and uh, your feedback helps us plan for uh, more webinars uh, coming up. This webinar will be available uh, on our YouTube channel um, uh, in about a week. So uh, we'll make sure that we post that uh, link as well on our Facebook page if you follow us on Facebook. Um, so with that, um, thank you very much for joining us and uh, hope to see you back next time.